maybe let, let, let's start, no? Uh, uh, we are lucky to have uh, Daniele Michiancio, Professor Daniele Michiancio from UCSD. Uh, I was lucky to uh, be in the same PhD between all three at uh, MIT with Daniele when he was getting a PhD with them. And uh, since then he's at UCSD. He's uh, the author of Foundation out there. Uh, I guess it's the only still uh, uh, book, textbook on lattice cryptography. Uh, the key part for the you know uh, onslaught of uh, results on on lattice cryptography so he's a foundational person in the field and he's been doing uh, lattice crypto for, for forever doing all sorts of interesting things within it and also uh, touching all sorts of other uh, things in cryptography foundational things in cryptography applications uh, he's really a fountain of uh, fantastic uh, ideas and uh, we're lucky to have uh, him here uh, thank you Daniel, for coming hey thank you for the introduction i especially appreciate it uh, you're one of the few people that can pronounce my name correctly yeah <laughs> and then thanks for the invitation it's a pleasure to stop here so um yeah so my area is lattice cryptography regarding the book uh, uh, there's a really big need of a new book on lattice cryptography. Things uh, changed so much uh, since then that, uh, uh, so this book that was mentioned by Stashi Sunday, today is considered more complex than cryptography. But homomorphic encryption is one of the big things that happened in lattice cryptography since then. And it's also one of the problems that uh, brought uh, lattices uh, under the spotlight because uh, it is uh, a problem that uh, still to this day, we know how to solve uh, to some extent using lattices, but we do not know how to solve using other mathematical problems, except for a few exceptions and uh, you know, more experimental constructions. But by and large, lattices is the only game in town for homomorphic encryption. They also have many other useful, attractive properties, including uh, the parallelizability. You can easily compute those functions in parallel, and also the conjecture resistance against quantum computers, differently from factoring-based cryptography, or more generally cryptography based on number theory. Lattice cryptography is not known how to be breakable even using quantum computers. So in this talk, I will talk about one specific line of research that developed in the last five years or so called homomorphic encryption on approximate numbers. And the fact that the computation is performed approximately is something that, as we'll see, makes a big difference. And so the talk is based on joint work with my uh, students, at the time students, some of them graduated by now, Bayou, Mark, and uh, Jessica. And if, in the talk, I will cover only part of the things that we did. You can find many more details uh, if you go and read the, the papers. So moving forward, so what is homomorphic encryption? So homomorphic encryption is a, a special type of uh, cryptographic schemes that allow to perform computations on encrypted data. Now, normally, when you encrypt something using a cryptographic function, even in a sort of intuitive way, you can think of the encryption as putting the data in some type of black box. Once you put the data there, you cannot change it. The box is protecting the data. And this can be very useful to protect data in transit over a communication network, or also to protect the data when stored on a device. However, locking the data inside encryption uh, is something that can be an obstacle to some of the modern applications of computers where you perform distributed storage, you put most of your data uh, today lives probably not on your computer, or, or perhaps it does because you are computer science students, so you still understand the difference. But for, for most people out there, the computer is just a window on the internet and the data lives in some kind of universe that allows to share data with other people. And where the data is physically doesn't really, uh, uh, is not even part 
part of the user uh, model. It's convenient that you can access your data from multiple locations and having the, at least the appearance of this data being accessible uh, to you uh, everywhere and from different devices. But it should be clear that this is also something that raises uh, security uh, issues. The data is accessible to you. In principle, it's also accessible to the world, to everybody. And in this setting, just encrypting the data does not uh, solve the problem in the best way. The reason is that uh, these days, uh, cloud computing uh, is uh, about computing, not just storage. So you want to be able uh, to store the data securely on a remote server, and you want to be able to process the data on the server, running your program on the server. Now, this something can be done, for example, if you share your decryption key to the server, but of course, this uh, is putting trust on the server. It's not something that is quite desirable. So ideally, you would like an encryption scheme that allows you to encrypt the data, put the encrypted data on some uh, server, on some computer that does not have access to the decryption key, and then tell to the server to run a program on this encrypted data in encrypted form without ever decrypting the data, without even knowing the decryption key. And of course, the result of the computation will be encrypted. That final result is sent to you, and then you can decrypt the final result of the computation without having to download and decrypt a huge amount of data. You just need to get the final result, and you can keep everything secure, even on a, an untrusted server, or a server that is semi-trusted. It's not trusted to the full extent. You are still trusting the server to execute the program that you want to run. If you don't trust the computer, the server to do that, then you have to put other cryptographic tools on top of this, something called the verifiable computation, and something that can be addressed using zero knowledge proofs, something I will not talk about uh, today. But uh, um, the key operation is this app, this red uh, app in the feature, which is a function, you can think of it as a program, that you want to send to the server and then have it applied to the ciphertext, but in a way that the operations are performed inside the encryption without decrypting, computing, and re-encrypting. So a brief history of uh, homomorphic encryption. So I will abbreviate this as FHE, just uh, for uh, brevity. Uh, that stands for fully homomorphic encryption. The word fully is there only to distinguish this from encryption schemes that only allow to perform certain simple operations. For example, addition. There were already many schemes, uh, or at least uh, some uh, cryptographic schemes, supporting homomorphic addition, meaning that you can adapt ciphertext together. Fully homomorphic means that you can evaluate arbitrary programs on encrypted data. And so the problem was originally proposed by Rivest, Adelman, and Nertuzos back in 1978, so way before uh, most developments in modern uh, cryptography. And for the longest time, it remained a big open theoretical problem. It was wide open, meaning that the cryptographic community was split between people that thought that the problem was just impossible to solve, and they were trying to prove impossibility results, and people trying to come up with constructions, but without being able to do that. And there were a few scattered examples of candidate constructions proposed now and then, which were all broken quite quickly. Now, the turning point in the development of homomorphic encryption was a breakthrough result by uh, Craig Gentry, who in 2009 came up with a technique called uh, bootstrapping, which allows uh, to amplify the capabilities of a homomorphic encryption scheme. And uh, it reduces the problem of building a fully homomorphic encryption scheme to one that only has limited homomorphic capabilities. And then he also came up with a candidate construction for the building block. Now, the candidate construction got broken. So that's something that, that uh, didn't leave. I mean, it was there for a few years. But by the time attacks to the candidate constructions were discovered, 
there were already better schemes. So it's something, it, it didn't really matter. Right? But this uh, intuition that you could uh, use this bootstrapping technique to simplify the problem and then solving it <clears> the <throat> simpler problem. So that's something that was used in all subsequent works on homomorphic encryption. So all the known schemes make use of this fundamental technique. So it was really the game changer in the development of this type of schemes. Now, the first scheme based on standard, solid, well-understood assumptions on lattices, which happened to be my uh, research area, uh, is the one that was designed by Prakersky and by Quintanatan in 2011. And uh, uh, at the time, uh, the scheme was uh, still uh, uh, fairly far from being uh, efficient. Even today, this is a very uh, complex type of cryptographic problem. Getting efficient constructions is uh, quite uh, challenging. This is also one of the reasons so there is uh, a lot of interest these days on uh, performing this type of constructions in hardware to get a little bit of a speed up or boost to perform uh, these complex uh, computations and perhaps also sell new data centers that can do homomorphic encryption in hardware. <laughs> and uh, there's been a lot of progress since then, since 2009, 2011, and pretty much every year there were new schemes being proposed. All the schemes have much in common, so they follow this general bootstrapping strategy, mm. and uh, some of them, if you look at them, even at the syntactical level, the similarities are quite, quite strong. And they were all based, by and large, on one fixed standard problem, which is the learning with errors problem. I will tell you a little bit more about it later in this talk. But what I will focus on in this talk is one specific type of construction called approximate homomorphic encryption that was first suggested by John Kim and Song in 2017 which uh, was able to achieve uh, a substantial efficiency improvement uh, over the previous exact schemes uh, at the cost of performing computations only in an approximate manner. So you don't get the exact result of the computation, you get something close to it. But getting approximate solutions is something that is uh, fine in most applications. Think of applications in data science and machine learning where even the input data is already noisy, the learning process is noisy, if there is some approximation, it was already there to start with. They didn't seem to make much of a difference from a functionality point of view, but it was useful to improve performance by quite a bit. I'll try to highlight what was the property, this connection between approximation and performance later in, uh, in the talk, but uh, uh, the talk will be mostly focused on security. What does it mean for a scheme to be secure? Without a notion of security, a clear definition of what it means, what are you achieving from a security <coughs> point of view, there's no point in doing cryptography. I mean, cryptography is just as good as what uh, you can uh, 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 build from uh, the definitions and <coughs> proofs that are provided to you as a building block. Now, unless uh, you are a professional cryptographer, you should not uh, design cryptographic functions. And this is something that is well established. Everybody knows there, that. <laughs> but even if you're not a cryptographer and you're a user, you're somebody interested in security. And these days, pretty much everybody has to deal uh, with cryptography, uh, with security at some level. You still need to be able to make good, proper use of cryptographic functions. And how do you do that? Uh, it's not something that is based on the low level operations of the functions that often uh, perform uh, uh, operations using various types of mathematical structures that uh, you may or may not, may not even know, like uh, elliptic curves or other type of uh, mathematical objects like lattices. You just want to work with some kind of specification, a security uh, specification. I will interject. You take a crypto class. In order to learn how to you, you take a crypto class from me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the man, okay? So, 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 in fact, you know, this talk was just an um, advertisement for, uh, <laughs> for this class. Uh, anyway, so um, uh, there are many, many approaches to homomorphic encryption. So, I'm talking about this approximate one because it's something that really highlights the importance of definitions. 
it's something also that I worked on in the last few years, but it's not really uh, the main uh, line of work. Uh, uh, when it comes to constructions, I've been uh, pursuing homomorphic encryption along a completely different path, uh, uh, which uh, started in 2015. Uh, the scheme is called uh, FU, F-A-G-W, with the then uh, uh, postdoc Leo Duca, uh, now back in uh, Europe, in Amsterdam. And uh, so that's a scheme that has many interesting users useful features. I'm not talking about it uh, just because uh, uh, there's not, uh, it's something, so it's a different type of issues, but it's very interesting. So I'll have, so let me advertise a little bit also my, my, my other work. So uh, approximate the homomorphic encryption. So this is an outline of the talk. What we'll do is uh, to first talk a little bit about definitions. So how do you define, especially security? What does it mean for a homomorphic encryption to be secure? What do you expect it to be easy or hard to do by an adversary. Then I will briefly describe, I will sketch the key features of the construction that was proposed by CK, KNS in this approximate encryption scheme construction. Interestingly, the construction in the paper I proposed it was um, proved secure based on the same learning with error assumption and according to the same uh, definition of security that the other papers was, were using. The only difference is that the scheme was approximate. And I'll show you in the talk that despite all of this, the scheme as originally proposed is completely insecure. You can get a very fast, complete break key recovery attack that in a snap will find the secret key of the crypto system when the system is used exactly as it was intended to be used. Now, the attack we'll see is just as much to the definition as to the construction. So the uh, key uh, takeaway from the work is that uh, modifying the correctness definition of an encryption scheme is something that can have deep implication on security. Not just because the result is wrong, but it can have implications of the type, uh, once the computation is not exact, whatever definition you were using before, whatever definition of uh, secure encryption has been used for the last 40 years, becomes meaningless. It doesn't give you anything anywhere close to you would normally expect from a secure encryption scheme. And then I will conclude with a few more words if I have time about some recent trends and ongoing work along these lines. So, um, so the talk is a little bit technical. So I'll be having definitions and um, not big mathematical formulas, I can promise you that, but uh, there's a little bit of uh, technicalities uh, here and there, but uh, uh, you are all computer science, uh, most of you students, so I guess it's a good way to get exposed to cryptography and then take a, a full cryptography class to learn more about it. So uh, in an uh, encryption scheme, in a public key encryption scheme, you have three algorithms. You have a key generation algorithm, an encryption algorithm and encryption algorithm, which are used as follows. You use the key generation algorithm, GEN, to generate a pair of keys, a public key, which is used for encryption, and a secret key, which is used for decryption. Now, this is called public because you want everybody to be able to encrypt, while decrypting, decoding the message, should be possible only to, for the owner of the secret key, that is typically the person that generated the key pair. And making the encryption operation public is useful so that everybody can send you data. In the context of homomorphic encryption, this allows to multiple parties to encrypt data under a common public key that is known to everybody, combine the data together in encrypted form, and then perform homomorphic computations on these larger data sets that can be very useful, for example, in the context of, uh, uh, think of different hospitals uh, or uh, financial services uh, or other uh, security sensitive businesses that are not allowed to share information about their uh, clients. But still, there is a public utility from combining the information, for example, to perform a joint medical study on some uh, rare disease where uh, no individual institution has enough data uh, to uh, perform the study. So this is something that allows to 
combine the data together in encrypted form and then operate on it in encrypted form without ever decrypting it. So this is uh, public key encryption. And before we move to the homomorphic computation, let me briefly, very briefly uh, tell you what type of security do you expect as a sort of baseline today for security? Now, security considers a typical application and attack scenario. And uh, uh, think of these encryption and decryption functions being used in some uh, application. And uh, data is being exchanged over a possibly insecure network. And there is an adversary that is able to monitor all the communications. We are assuming that the functions, encryptions, decryption, and key generation, they are executed by honest parties, because they are trying to protect their own security. But everything that is exchanged is visible to an adversary. So for example, the adversary gets to see the public key, which is sent by one party to the other one in order to collect the data. And he also gets to see the ciphertext, the result of encrypting a message under the public key. We can also let the attacker choose the messages being encrypted. Now, this seems a little bit odd at first. Why would you let the adversary to choose the message? Then what is there to protect? Now, this is just a technical mm, trick to model the fact that uh, you want security for a general purpose encryption scheme. You are not fixing the application. You don't want to decide in advance how the encryption scheme is uh, going to be used. So think of this choice of the message to some in some sense as being the adversary choosing the application that is being targeted. So how the data is generated, what type of messages are being sent depends on the application. We let the adversary to choose which application they will try to break. So we let the adversary pick the messages and the adversary can also see the result of the decryption. So after the message is encrypted, sent and decrypted, the adversary gets to see the result. And again, you may at first ask, how can the adversary see the result? You want to protect it. Well, in many situations, data is revealed at some point. So you want, for example, to announce the winner of this university project competition at the end of the crypto class. Perhaps first the data is published in encrypted form, and then at some point you reveal what was the underlying message. So in the case of a medical study on encrypted data, of course, you are going to reveal at some point the result of the study. So there will be at least a partial information about the data that will be learned by the adversary at some point. So you should assume that the adversary can get to see all of those things. And then you want to model this type of uh, scenario using uh, a cryptographic definition. Now, before I get to the actual definition, uh, uh, which is a standard definition that dates back to four years ago, let me just mention that there are stronger types of attack models called uh, uh, active attacks. What I described before is a passive attack where the adversary can only monitor the communication on the network. You can also consider active attacks where the adversary can tamper and modify the messages in transit. So this is something that is a little bit beyond the scope of homomorphic encryption because modifying the data is something that is explicitly allowed by homomorphic encryption schemes. You want to be able to compute on the data. So usually in the context of homomorphic computation, we only consider passive adversaries. And the standard definition, the gold standard of definition of security for encryption under passive attacks is what is called indistinguishability under chosen plain test attacks or in the CPA security. And this is a definition that was proposed back in 1984 by Goldwasser and Michali. And uh, the idea is that uh, the encryption scheme should not leak any partial information about the input. So everything should be protected. It should be hard not only to recover the message from the ciphertext, but even distinguishing two arbitrary cipher messages should be hard under this type of attacks. Now, this is the uh, pictorial representation of the definition. You consider an adversary that is given the public key because everybody knows the public key. And based on this public key, the adversary chooses two messages. 
These are two possible messages that the adversary is unsure about which one is being encrypted. The adversary is given the encryption of one of the two. So a bit B is chosen at random and the encryption of MB is sent to the adversary and the adversary has to guess which of the two messages was encrypted. So this model, the harness of recovering even partial information about the input. Now think of the message being encrypted is just the answer to a yes, no question. Like, did you like my talk? Let's collect the data. And you want to do it in encrypted form so that I don't get to see the answer, but perhaps uh, uh, yeah, who's running the seminar can collect this as a feedback and decide whether to uh, invite me to talk ever again, okay? Now, there are only two possible messages. So if this M1 and M0 could be yes and no. And if the adversary can tell the difference between those two specific messages, then the application is broken, okay? So, of course, you can guess that bit B with probability one half. If you have any advantage beyond the one half, any non negligible advantage in figuring out if it was a yes or no, then you'll be able to. Uh, so, th that's considered a serious attack. As another example, probably more profitable, is uh, think of uh, financial data that is uh, sent uh, here and there. If you manage, sometimes certain information shouldn't be disclosed until uh, a certain date. So if uh, you manage to uh, uh, collect even partial information in advance, uh, and then you use it for trading, uh, well, it is illegal, of course. Still, uh, it's something that you want, it's something you want to avoid uh, uh, from happening. And uh, if data is being exchanged and should be protected, it is important even to even get in a bias. Uh, some, uh, you don't know for sure what it is, but you know that, uh, for example, say this stock is more likely to go up or down based on some privileged information. You can still, uh, you know, make an illegal profit on the average. So it's something that you want uh, to protect uh, against. Okay, so uh, this definition is very, very simple. So you like read that uh, is uh, sort of uh, really cut to the bone. So it's as simple as, as it uh, gets. There are no applications, just two messages, figuring out which of the two is encrypted. But the definition is very, very robust. You can give more complex definitions of encryption, of secure encryption, that involve the adversary getting to see not only one, but multiple ciphertexts. You can consider the adversary getting to see the result of the decryption function on messages that were sent before. You can even consider a multi-key, multi-user setting where there are multiple keys, multiple users exchanging data in all possible combinations. And all these extended definitions that you can formulate can be proved equivalent to this basic ing CPA formulation that I described in the previous slide. And this is why this definition is considered such a good definition. It's a proved, well-tested definition that passed the test of time for 40 years, and still today is a good definition. So easy to use, simple, but very powerful. Now let's get to homomorphic encryption. So what is a homomorphic encryption scheme? It's an encryption scheme that also has an evaluation algorithm. And the scheme has the following property. So if you take a message M and you want to compute on it, say you want to evaluate a certain function F on it, well, you compute this computer, you can evaluate the function in the clear, given M and F, you can, you, you can compute F of M, and then perhaps you can encrypt it later. Or you can first encrypt M, then using this evaluation algorithm, you can evaluate the function F on the encryption of M in encrypted form without knowing the secret decryption key you will obtain some other ciphertext. And in a homomorphic encryption scheme, if you decrypt the result of the homomorphic evaluation of your program on the encrypted input, you expect to find exactly f of m, the result that you would have obtained from running your program in the clear. Now, this is the definition of a correct encryption scheme. It doesn't say what uh, security is, but it tells you what uh, um, the functionality of the scheme. Now, uh, how do you define definition for this scheme? Now, this may seem a little bit complex. Uh, let me just uh, tell you what the idea is. So it's this, this general intuition that the definition should capture a typical attack scenario. So what can a typical attacker get to see or get to do in an application of a homomorphic encryption scheme? 
Uh, the adversary can choose messages that are going to get encrypted, similar to the NCPA definition. For example, yes, no, or some other data. <coughs> so there are messages that get encrypted. Messages can also be computed on. So you may evaluate a function f on a message m2 to get a message m3. And you can perform perhaps also multiple uh, computations. You can evaluate function g on m3 to get, a fun to, to get some other message m4. And uh, this computation can also be performed on the cipher texts using the evaluation uh, algorithm. And uh, when the function is computed in encrypted form, the adversary gets to see all these cipher texts. It gets to see not only the result of the encryption of the original messages, it also gets to see all these intermediate cipher texts that are produced during the homomorphic computation perhaps by um, you know, hacking into the server that is uh, storing the encrypted data, performing computation into the, in the, on the encrypted data. The server is not fully trusted, doesn't have the secret key. <coughs> so even uh, uh, if somebody gets to read the ciphertext, shouldn't be able to figure out what the messages are. And the adversary can also see the final result of the computation. So at some point, the adversary may say, OK, program was done. The results get decrypted. And the adversary gets to see the result of the decryption. So it's similar to NCPA type of attack model. It's a passive at attacker. But uh, uh, there are also computations that are performed. Now, uh, you, you can formulate this uh, uh, using something that we call the uh, in the CPA security with decryption oracles, because we allow the adversary to see the final result of the computation in decrypted form at the very end. And the idea is that uh, in a typical application, you are encrypted some security sensitive data, performing perhaps some statistical analysis to compute the average and standard deviation. Then you will publish the result. So you will decrypt the final result of the computation. And you want this final result to reveal something useful, say the mean, the average, or some other statistics of the data, but shouldn't reveal other partial information about the original data sets, which have private uh, values. So in this uh, type of uh, game, uh, attack scenario, the adversary should still be unable to tell the difference between any two uh, values. So how do you formulate that? So in order to capture the hardness of capturing additional information beyond the result of the decryption, consider the following experiment. So in the encryption queries, the adversary can provide not one, but two messages, just like in the definition of NCPA security, two messages that the adversary is trying to distinguish. Now think of this B0 and B1 as being two different worlds, a world where at the end you want to take a certain decision, say, to buy the stock, the other one is the one where at the end you would take the opposite decision. You're trying to tell the difference between these two. You know what's going to happen in one or the other one, but you don't know in which of these two worlds you are in. And the adversary will specify this pairs of messages and will be given the encryption of one of them without knowing which one. It will also issue computation queries. The computations will be performed in parallel in these two worlds on different data, possibly producing different results. And uh, the computation is also done in encrypted form on the ciphertext. The adversary gets to see the ciphertext. And at some point, the adversary can ask to decrypt the ciphertext. Now, the decryption queries are allowed only if the result of the decryption is the same. If M04 and M14 are the same value, then the adversary is told what the result of the computation is. And the idea is that, of course, if you reveal the result of the computation, the adversary is going to learn that. We want to say that the adversary doesn't learn anything else about it, about the input data beyond the final result. So if the final result is the same, that's all the adversary knows. So that's the only piece of information given to the adversary. Now, now this is a definition. And... Uh, um, so this is just a more technical uh, description of the same definition. You don't need it. Just the intuition is uh, enough. And uh, something that is uh, a, something that could be considered a standard uh, exercise, homework assignment in the cryptographic class is uh, to show that if a scheme satisfies the basic definition of in the CPA security, the one without homomorphism, 
without computations, then it also satisfies this stronger definition. And the idea, uh, going back to the previous slide, the idea is that uh, when the adversary makes this decryption query, so the adversary knows the messages on the left, the adversary knows the messages on the right, doesn't know if we are on the left or the right side. When it is given the decryption of the final result of the computation, and it is given this result only if the two messages are the same, the adversary knows already in advance what message is being given. It's the same in both cases. So you can simulate this extra information collected by the adversary simply by looking at the previous queries, looking at what the adversary already knows, and say, yes, that's the result of the computation. Similarly, these ciphertexts, which are the result of the homomorphic operations, these are all uh, computed using a eval function that is publicly available. Anybody can run that. So by monitoring the ciphertext computed during the computation, the adversary doesn't get uh, to see anything that he couldn't compute on its own. So uh, some uh, observations about uh, these definitions of security. Now, once uh, you establish that uh, this homomorphic definition of security with decryption oracles is equivalent to the original one, you will also notice that the original definition was not using the evaluation algorithm, was only using the key generation and the encryption algorithm. Decryption and evaluation are not part of the definition. So you can apply the previous definition to a homomorphic encryption scheme and argue that, oh, it is a good encryption scheme. Now, it turns out that this is true, but only provided the encryption scheme is exact, is correct. It no, long, it no longer holds if the encryption scheme is approximate. So let me move to approximate encryption schemes. Now, uh, I'll talk specifically about the CKKS, which is essentially the only approximate encryption scheme that has been proposed. It was very well motivated by applications where input data is uh, uh, already approximate and noisy as the typical machine learning applications that are getting a lot of attention uh, as uh, possible target uh, applications for homomorphic encryption. And uh, uh, so I will consider a sort of simplified version of the scheme using the basic learning with error problem. So without using the packing, for those of you that are familiar uh, with, that have seen uh, these or similar schemes, so the uh, scheme was also putting many values together inside a single vector and then operating on this vector of messages in parallel. This study is completely orthogonal to the security issues that I wanted to address. And the attack can be easily adapted to the original version of the scheme. So, so these are I have two slides, uh, please bear me with me. These are the two most technical slides in the talk. Is a, a pictorial representation of how lattice-based encryption works. So there is a secret S, which is used to decrypt messages, and I will use it also for encryption. I'm considering secret key encryption rather than public key encryption because it doesn't really make any difference for the attack. And uh, the learning with error problem, which is, a, which is a basic fundamental problem on lattices, which is computationally hard, and it is at the core of uh, pretty much uh, all modern lattice cryptography constructions. The, uh, is the following. So you, are, you, you pick a random matrix A, perhaps with entries modulo Q for some small integer uh, Q, so you're doing modular arithmetic, and you compute AS plus E. So you compute a function that uh, maps A to some vector B using some secret information, S and E. And the learning with error problem says that uh, these two values, A and B, they are going to look like random values. Now, A is random. That's how it was chosen. Now, B is not random. It's far from random. It's obtained by taking a, a combination of the columns in A and then adding a small perturbation to it. So it's something that for appropriate parameter settings will be far from being uniform. But the assumption is that no adversary can tell the difference between that and an actual random value. 
Now, this can be used to build a public key encryption scheme by saying AB is the public key, while SE is the secret key. And it is harder to go from the public key back to the secret key. But let's look at how this is used for encryption. So let's say that A and B are the encryption key. You can take a random combination of the rows of this extended matrix, A, B. So you will map it to a single vector. And uh, if you just use the basic properties of uh, matrix algebra, you will see that uh, this vector, uh, that this value that you obtain, can also be obtained using the secret key. So you can uh, first multiply A by S and then by R, or first multiply A by R and then by S. So just using the associativity of uh, matrix multiplication and vector matrix multiplication, you see that you can compute the same value in two different ways except for this error term. But this error term is going to be small. So if you um, put some redundancy in your message, let's say that uh, this error is at most 10, you can scale your message by a factor 100, and then uh, by rounding, you can get rid of this uh, error term. Now, I'm not going to use the exact technical definition uh, in the other slides, so don't worry. This was just to give you the high-level intuition of uh, what does the scheme look like. So there is a scaling factor, delta, which is used to correct these errors. And the scaling factor should be big enough to correct the errors. And you can achieve this by using larger numbers uh, overall. So it has a performance cost, but it seems something reasonable. Now, this is a reasonable performance cost as long as you are just encrypting and then decrypting. There is a problem in the context of homomorphic properties. And the problem is the following. So when you adapt to ciphertexts, again, without getting lost into the low-level details, just using linearity of matrix multiplication, it's easy to see that the previous scheme has certain linear homomorphic properties. If you adapt to ciphertexts, you will get uh, something that is pretty close to an encryption of the two original messages with a noise term with an error which is the sum of the original errors. So the error is grown, it's not staying the same. It's, it's a lower quality ciphertext than a freshly encrypted message. But as long as uh, your scaling factor is big enough, you can accommodate for uh, this error and correct from it. Now, the problem is that uh, uh, these errors will accumulate. And when instead of just a simple addition, you perform a multiplication, so the error will grow geometrically by a factor which is the scaling factor delta. So you need to use some, if you want to uh, perform a, a computation that involves uh, 10 multiplication layers, then you will need to work with numbers which are... Uh, um, did I say 10 layers? I forgot. 10 layers, so you, you will need to use numbers which are at least delta to the 10. Okay? So even increasing delta by a factor two, adding just one extra bit in the noise space, that something is going to have an exponential impact on the numbers that you need to use. So using a small delta is something that has a big benefit in the context of homomorphic encryption. The error will go, grow slower, and you can work, you can perform more complex computations before ciphertext become undecryptable and the scheme is not good anymore. Now, uh, the idea of this CKKS scheme, this approximate encryption scheme, was the following. Forget about delta. Forget about exact decryption. We don't care about it. Take delta to be one. So no scaling at all. The decryption is not correct. That's okay. You still get something which is close to the correct result. And setting delta to be one means that you don't have this accumulating effect of every time you multiply, things go by factor delta. And still, error is growing, but a much lower rate than what is required by exact computation schemes. So this seemed like a great idea. And to some extent, it's still a great idea. It's something that improves the performance of the scheme. That's the only difference. This is the basic difference between CKKS and the previous schemes removing delta. So it was, in some sense, uh, was uh, taking something out from what was being done before to correct the error and just uh, decide to live with the errors. 
Plus, the scheme was already proved in CPA security. So it seemed a safe scheme to use. And uh, so it's not surprising that uh, uh, it seemed to have the same security properties as before, but these extra efficiency features. So what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this is that uh, the scheme is still in CPA secure, but it's not in CPA D secure. The more complex definition that I said is a good definition to model the intuition of an attack to a typical application of homomorphic encryption, which allows the adversary to perform computations and get to see the result of the decryption. So that doesn't hold anymore. The two definitions are not equivalent. And in the specific case of CKKS, they end up resulting in a pretty bad attack. Now, uh, whenever proofs break down, uh, cryptography teaches that we should be uh, cautious and suspicious about it. If there is no proof, then uh, there is no security. That's at least for a theoretician. Now, before something gets broken in practice, it may take a lot of effort but uh, the, the history of cryptographic design is uh, full of examples that were first shown uh, not to be secu theoretically secure, but the attack, the, the insecurity was initially disregarded because nobody knew how to break it. But then with sufficient effort, people were able to break the schemes uh, and often in pretty bad ways. So what happened uh, uh, in this case? Uh, looking at the proof and why the proof of security breaks down actually also pinpoints uh, to the issue. And the issue is the following. So while in, an, in the exact scheme, in, to this, in these two words, M0 and 1, you get two messages. If they are the same, the decryption will give you that, and you can simulate that. You already know what it is. In the approximate encryption scheme, you don't know what you're going to get. You're going to get something which is close to it, but you don't know what it is. So it's close to it. So what's the problem? If you're fine about uh, the noise in the application, this seems to be pretty safe. But there is a, a first seemingly remote possibility that uh, whatever you cannot predict may leak information about the secret key. So the fact that you cannot simulate it, the fact that you cannot compute it on your own, says that in principle, it may be exploited to gain information <coughs> well beyond knowing the approximate value of the final computation, which seems to be even less information than the exact, if you get the exact value, that seems to be better for the attacker than the approximate one. You're getting noise information. So that would be true if the noise uh, in the final result were independent of the secret key. But if it is correlated with a secret key, then it may lead to a complete break. Well, after observing the final result of the computation, not only you get the input data, you get the secret key, and you can even decrypt other data sets on which you didn't perform any computation at all. So it's something that would be a total disaster from a security point of view. So I will briefly sketch how the basic version of the attack works. And uh, for the students, you are all welcome to so go over the slides on your own and then follow the steps and see how it works because it's all there. It's very, very simple. If you look at how messages are encrypted and then decrypted. So, the encry so think of the adversary doing something very, very innocuous, which is oh, just encrypt zero. Okay. So the encryption of zero is something of the form RA and RB. Then uh, you decrypt uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, value. And in the encryption, I'm putting 0, 0, meaning that I don't even try to distinguish left or from right. It's just encrypt 0. It's just to get a ciphertext. So when we get to decrypt this value and we perform this approximate decryption, you are not given 0. You are given this error, which is a small va random value. Now, this more random value is something that, if subtracted from the original ciphertext, will give you RAS, which is a linear equation, a system of linear equations in the secret key S. So if you do this a number of times, you can collect a bunch of linear equations and then just solve a linear system and recover the secret S completely. And that's the attack. So without even performing homomorphic computation, it's just encrypt zero. Please decrypt it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know it's zero, but please decrypt it anyway and tell me what you come up with, just to check that the error is small. I get the error, and from the error, I get the secret key. 
So, um, so this is the attack. It's something that went uh, completely under the radar, was unnoticed because the scheme was uh, satisfying this uh, uh, well-tested definition of in the CPA security. I omit many, many details in this talk. We have extensions. We show how this works on uh, um, typical computations you want to do in machine learning, for example, a median and standard deviation computation. So, so you can build a realistic example. You will still get an attack that works with probability practically one in a fraction of a second. Script analysis sometimes, even if it takes months, you're still happy about it. You declare the scheme broken. Here you can run the attack on your laptop and in just a fraction of a second collect enough, enough operations. Uh, questions to recover the secret. Now, this scheme, because of its potential utility in these uh, uh, encrypted machine learning uh, uh, applications, had been widely implemented and used in uh, no real world applications because we are still talking about research uh, experimental uh, prototypes. But it was included in many open source uh, lattice uh, cryptography library. So HIAN was the library originally produced by the CKKS uh, paper, but the scheme was immediately or almost immediately included in pretty much any other uh, open source uh, um, homomorphic encryption library. And we try the attack against the concrete libraries, and it works just as well as predicted by the theory. So it is a natural concrete attack to be careful about. Now, in these last uh, 10 minutes, I want to sketch. Uh, so what's next? So what do you do? You take this crypto scheme, and you throw it away. People still want to use it. People want to do uh, machine learning on encrypted data, and they want to do it with a scheme that is reasonably efficient. For so uh, we suggested a method that uh, not only avoids the attack. So this is something that uh, we suggested right away as a method to avoid the attack. But then the question was, is this enough to prove that the revised scheme is secure according to this uh, in CPAD security definition that is appropriate for approximate homomorphic encryption? The idea is the following. So it's something that is inspired by the differential privacy, which uh, is uh, uh, the, so the idea is that uh, if you have uh, two, if you have a data set and you want to query the data set without leaking information about the data set within reasonable limits. So you may do the following. You could use a randomized mechanism M that given the database and a query queue, it answers the query and then it releases a sanitized version of the output, which is sanitized by adding some noise to it. So, so just make it fuzzy. And the property is that it's called differential privacy, because if you take two different databases, D and D prime, they differ only uh, for the information of a single user. So they are very, very close to each other. If you answer your query and then you add some noise to it, the noise that you are adding will be enough to flood the information about the specific user, and you expect the result of these two sanitized answers to be pretty much uh, the same. Now, here we use uh, this idea, but instead of uh, on the data sets, on the input data, which would be the typical application of differential privacy, we apply it to cipher texts. We are trying to protect the secret key. So think of the data set as uh, uh, whatever contains the secret key, the encryption randomness, and something you are trying to protect. And uh, uh, when you decrypt something, you will apply a differentially private mechanism. We need a special type. It's not, traditionally, in differential privacy, often distance is measured as humming distance in how many records to the database uh, differ. In the context of lattice cryptography, it's more natural and useful to consider databases as vectors and then looking at their uh, Euclidean distance, for example. And then the type of noise that you add they could be Gaussian noise that is added to these results. And so we show that using this uh, uh, sanitization, if you add, so if you take the decryption of a cipher text and then you add some noise to it, and this is the new uh, secure the decryption function, then you can show that the screen is probably secure. And, uh, uh, but how much noise should you add? And this is key both to efficiency and security. The noise should be enough so that you can prove security 
but small enough so that the result is still useful. So there is a price to adding more noise. So you can compensate for adding more noise by using bigger numbers, but then you're back to the, you, you would lose a good part of the efficiency benefits of approximate homomorphic encryption. So, uh, so let me skip uh, the proof sketch of why adding this allows to prove uh, uh, security. Uh, um, and, but let's look at the issue of quantifying security. So what we show is that uh, adding uh, k over two bits of noise allows to achieve k bits of security. So we can quantify how much noise you need to add to achieve security at a certain level. Typically, the number of bits of security you want to achieve is something that is mandated. For example, uh, you may have a requirement <clears throat> that uh, in order to consider data safe, you should use, uh, say, AES with 256 bits uh, keys or security level. And so you can quantify this, and you can try to calibrate the noise to the security level that is needed and to the noise that is already present in the scheme. Now, the noise that is already present in the scheme turns out not to be helpful. In fact, that's what you're trying to hide. Uh, it's a bit counterintuitive. So the noise that is already there, the bigger it is, the worse it is for you. There is more that you need to hide. You need to add this uh, differential uh, privacy noise that is bigger than the noise that you're trying to hide so that it gets flooded and it will not allow to leak the secret key. Now, I used the, the uh, um, so I said that you needed to calibrate the noise to the actual ciphertext that you are decrypting. And there are different ways to do it. And that's something that brings up a number of other uh, uh, security definitional questions. For example, uh, you, you, you can come up with some public estimate, what we call a static estimate, that just based on the computation you are performing can tell you the final ciphertext as at most uh, um, 10 bits of noise. You can evaluate a worst case precision for the final result. You can also perform a dynamic estimate performed by the decryption algorithm using the knowledge of the secret key. You can decrypt the message, look at how big is the noise, and then you can add some uh, uh, noise on top of it just to protect the actual noise of the specific ciphertext. Now, this second thing turns out not to work. I mean, the proof doesn't work, and we show that it still allows to carry out a certain type of attacks. Not as devastating as the previous ones, but still uh, it would keep you from achieving the definition of security. Now, uh, there is one last thing that I want to mention, uh, and, and then I'll promise you I'll finish my talk uh, in time, uh, and uh, which is uh, uh, how do you cost, how do you evaluate the cost of these measures? So I talked about uh, bits of security as something that uh, is uh, well defined, but it's not. I mean, bits of security is a common informal concept used in cryptography, but it's not something that uh, has ever been given a proper uh, definition. So you want to figure out how secure is enough, uh, how to measure security. In the context of block ciphers, security is identified with the size of the key. And the idea is that there is no better attack than exhaustive key search. But when you talk about bit of security for an arbitrary, possibly complex cryptographic primitive, just looking at the number of bits in the key is totally meaningless. Usually the uh, homomorphic encryption keys are huge, and that's not because they are so secure. This is because those keys are used to perform some very complex high-level operations. So you need some way to define security. And uh, 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 for search problems where you are trying to recover a secret, there is a fairly standard way to do it, uh, which uh, is intuitive, makes sense, and seems to work. But for indistinguishability problem, where you are trying to distinguish between two ciphertexts, for example, security can be described in terms of two parameters. The running time, T, of the attacker, and the advantage that the attacker has in distinguishing encryptions of zero from encryptions of one. And so assume that, uh, sorry, assume that the running time is 2 to the n, and the adversary has an advantage that is at most 2 to the minus k. Now, you may think that, okay, perhaps uh, security should be defined as n plus k. 
because if uh, uh, so if the attack takes time to do the end then the same bits of security if the attack is very fast but it's very unlikely to work it works with probability to do the minus n then also that's something that may be reasonably called n bits of security and that's probably the way it is written in many cryptography papers so it turns out that, that, that that's not really i don't think that's the right way so there's another paper it's not about homomorphic encryption it's a paper i wrote with another student michael walter back in 2018 where we propose a definition of bit security that involves adversaries that when trying to distinguish between two alternatives zero and one can say zero they can say one or they can also say i don't know and the idea is that uh, if you don't know if you say i don't know that's better than taking a random guess so that's why it's just the same as when you get the negative points for getting the wrong answer on uh, on a multiple choice question and uh, yeah you, you should penalize for random guesses and uh, while not answering so if you answer only with probability two to the minus k is something that can be identified with being k bits of security getting the right answer or not so the advantage in, in getting the right answer that's something that should be counted as twice the number of bits of security it's something that should give, be given more value in a specific quantitative way in the paper we give some very convincing examples that that's the right way to measure uh, bit uh, uh, security now there are many other related problems that came up in this last work but let me uh, uh, conclude so what is the final takeaway so uh, applications and attacks uh, are always uh, the most exciting things for everybody, including cryptographers. Uh, there is uh, nothing like an attack breaking a scheme or a new exciting application for something that people didn't know how to do before. But still, in order for security to work and cryptography to work, definitions are of fundamental importance. And as much as they may be a bit boring, I hope I didn't bore you too much with this talk with definitions rather than new encryption schemes, they are really the, the, main, the key to the game of security. And another takeaway is that whenever you modify something that is even seemingly innocuous, like the correctness property, you should always re revisit the security definitions to see if they are still appropriate. Maybe they are not as good as you thought once you are applying it to, a, to something that is not an encryption scheme. So the fact that an encryption scheme is exact was a given before. So it is not you revisit the definition. Approximate computations is something that raises a bunch of all new problems of its own. And even traditional, very uh, simple things like bit security is something that may be well worth revisiting and exploring. So this concludes my talk. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. I know some, some of you have to leave to next class or whatnot, but if you have uh, questions, please uh, take them up. Now would be a good time. I'm also happy to take questions offline later. I'll be hearing them. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, uh, is there a generic transformation from the approximate FHE to the to uh, exact FHE. So it sounds like you can just modify the input to the CPS. Yeah, yeah, you can. And that was, was done on the previous scheme. So, so in some sense, the approximate encryption scheme, <laughs> what it did was to take away that. So the previous schemes, you can think of them as uh, applying a form of error correction to the message, which is a scaling factor and then uh, rounding to correct the error. What do you think about those? It has an efficiency cost. It's not the cost of rounding and multiplying, which is very, very fast. It's the impact that this has on the error drop of the encryption scheme. So uh, finding uh, alternative ways to perform error correction in a way that has a smaller impact on error growth and efficiency. That's a very interesting uh, open problem. is like very information based in the sense of like Shannon. I think my microphone went silent at some point. That's Just right. like basically if you can reveal you, like, you, you, were these corrections that you created for the CKKS uh, adopted in the library? So were they adopted in the library? So first uh, the libraries, uh, they, when they saw, they saw the attack, they recognized that, yeah, yeah. So, uh, in some libraries adopted the corrections, at least the heuristic ones. 
uh, some libraries uh, that were more vested into claiming a certain efficiency and parameters uh, levels, they decided to go to a different route, which is, uh, oh, we can still say that the scheme is secure as long as you never decrypt any message. So let's add a couple of lines on the library documentation saying not to use the decryption function unless you are never going to reveal the result of decryption to anybody, which is very risky because... Uh, uh, so it's great. Yeah. It's great, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought too. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, what you lose with it, so this fix doesn't come for free. So it's fairly cheap, meaning so in the context of CKKS, uh, uh, so, so we were doing uh, this uh, sort of precise bit security level estimation, uh, trying to keep the numbers uh, as small as possible because there is one specific barrier which, when hit, results in worse performance, which is uh, sticking to 64 bits arithmetics. So before the libraries were being designed to make the best possible use with 64 bits, or 32 if they wanted to target the 32 bits architectures. So there was no space left for the fix, okay? And the fix also, you know, even if we have this K over two or K over four with this bit security definition, we can say that, oh, you wanted to get uh, uh, 60 bits of security, you only needed to add the 30 bits of noise. So that's good. But still, uh, if you start from 64, if you remove 30, you're left uh, with only 30, and then uh, it starts being a little bit tight, OK? So if you move it to 128 bit uh, arithmetics, uh, then that's plenty of space uh, to get uh, very strong security. But I, I think only Palisade, the now OpenFHG, is the only library that uh, uh, decided that to provide uh, this level of security. Well, the libraries that uh, wanted to stick to 32, 64-bit implementation and uh, uh, keep backward compatibility still have the same applications running as before, they did something that I wouldn't recommend using in practice. So I don't understand why exactly, but the TFH folks also moved very recently to 128 bits. They don't have that. So, now, TFHG is a different type of right. scheme. So it's a scheme uh, of the few funds. So this FHG debut, the scheme that I designed uh, uh, with Leo Duca, is uh, a scheme that suggests a different method to homomorphic encryption. Rather than arithmetics on the numbers, it works on very small ciphertext, uh, even single bits, and then have a much faster uh, bootstrapping operation, which is performed after every gate, OK? So TFHG they did, they did some uh, improvements. Uh, so there are some technical differences. Uh, but uh, from my understanding is their library is only providing uh, uh, support for these type of schemes, for few like schemes. While uh, OpenFHG and so on, they support both CKKS, BGV, and also uh, a few TFHG. So, uh, so why they are using 128 bits is not clear to me. So I, I, I don't know. In fact, I mean, I'm not, uh, it seems to be something perhaps at the implementation level, I'm not, I'm not following too closely uh, uh, what is being done on the TFHG front, because I mean, most of the things that are being done on TFHG are things that could have been done just as fine to the original few scheme. There was no need to move to the torus and do this you know, funky arithmetic on real numbers. Uh, it makes the schemes, in some sense, less standard and harder to understand. So uh, why specifically they want to use 128 bits in that context? Uh, yeah, so if you know, you can tell me, and then I can guess you why that. But uh, it's, uh, unless they are adding CKKS type of schemes. But my understanding is that they they are not doing that because they are telling everybody not to use CKKS. I mean, it's a good way to promote their library, but, uh, and there are good ways. I mean, my paper was uh, saying that you use CKKS, you have to be careful. It should be used with great care. And uh, th they were very, very uh, sort of against CKKS. So, so something that TFHG did on top of the basic uh, scheme, the basic gate computation, is to build a library of higher level functions that implement uh, say arithmetics on integers uh, bit by bit using digital circuits, but then it's already provided by the library. So you can have uh, an input space, which is larger numbers, but then the numbers are uh, uh, operated on 
either bit by bit or at least in small chunks. So you can do two bits at a time, three and so on. So, uh, but the cost of uh, uh, generalizing the few light techniques to more than uh, one bit, the cost is exponential in the number of bits. So there was a paper in uh, 2018 showing how to get, they wanted to get eight bits arithmetics using certain techniques. And then they stopped at six because uh, going to six was already making the scheme not practical and eight would have been ridiculous. So the, the cost of increasing the native plain text space is very, very high. One more question. Um, so thanks for the talk. And um, like you said, I've been always curious about the application of FHE or whenever I uh, see the talk on the FHE. Uh, and you mentioned the private machine learning or like, uh, what was it, the statistical analysis before. Um, but I, I think it would be more meaningful with the, uh, many data from multi-party. So uh, my question is, is there any like FHE that supports the multi-party or um, is it only for the two-party? Multi-party computation. So, okay, so multi-party, so there are two different things. One is to have a multi-party user set. So there are data coming from different uh, parties that you want to put together. Then there is whether the computation is done by a single centralized server, or if you are doing uh, the distributed multi-party computation where the party, they keep uh, talking to each other. And that's what is called uh, secure multi-party computation. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, uh, MPC, multi-party computation, and FHE, they solve the same problem. But one of them is a distributed solution where security comes from different servers sharing the key, mm -hmm. while the other one is a centralized solution where there is a single key under which you can perform the computations. So in MPC, the servers, they need to keep talking to each other not only during the initial input stage, but also during the computation. They need to keep talking to each other. So this, but other than that, the two problems are the same at some level. So you, you can apply MPC to address the same type of applications, but you will have a different type of solution with a different type of security and trust model. So I'm not entirely sure if this answers the question, but you can refine it. Yeah. Uh, then, then in case of using FHE um, with a single server and multiple clients, uh, do the clients need to use the same key and how then the, the keys can be managed? Okay, so very good question. So, so you, so, and how to manage the key? So, so, you, so ideally, you want to do this only under a single key. But then, of course, this opens up uh, the door to the owner of the key to decrypting not only the final result but also the intermediate values mm -hmm. of the computation. Yes. So, what uh, is uh, done or what uh, you could do to address this issue is the following: you run, you use MPC to produce uh, a single key but with a shared secret key. The secret key is broken into secret shares. So, and there are different servers holding the, secret, the shares of the secret key, but there is a single public key. Then everybody can encrypt the data under the public key. You do the computation on a single server. The secret key is not used anywhere in FHE until you get to the decryption. And then only at the very end, when you want to decrypt the final result, you can use MPC to perform a distributed decryption of the final result. So interaction would be restricted only to the final decryption process rather than the entire computation. And that would also allow you to secure this uh, secret key so that uh, is, um, uh, yeah, no single party can access uh, the data. So this, this if you have multiple users. If you have a single user providing the data, usually the, the user encrypting the data and then decrypting the results is the same. You put encrypt, put the data on the cloud, it's sent back to you. So there is no uh, security issue with the single party, uh, party having the key. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.